You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapul. Episode 21 Manika Okay, so, um, this is Evelyn. Evelyn, why? I'm recording this on a tape because digital recordings can get wonky when it comes to the supernatural. I'm in the process of researching the connective tissue between dark, often violent supernatural occurrences in Toronto, those who call themselves elders. So far, I've identified a few by cross-referencing their names to records of well-to-do families in Toronto, genealogies, etc. Whether or not these people are alive today is yet to be confirmed. Oh, uh, also I flubbed the Latin name from the last time. I found actual records marking them the Ordo Fratum Manus Passai, but I guess that's what I get for Google translating my way through research. I think someone had the other name in their notes and was just as bad at Latin as I was. <clears throat> well, anyway. Uh, I found some old records dating all the way back to the 1940s. About the events that wiped out Hyde. The old ghost town in northeastern Ontario that used to have a request stop back in the day. In case you don't know the story of Hyde, it was built European style, with its cobblestone streets all leading into the village center. Kind of reminds me of Perth a little bit. I've got family over there, and visiting always feels like I'm traveling to another country. If it had kept on, it might have been a bigger tourist destination than Blue Mountain or Niagara on the lake. But... Back in the 40s, there was a town-wide fire that burned through quite a few houses that supposedly started in the center. Here's where it gets weird. It wasn't a huge town, but it had hundreds of people living there at its height. Around 500 at last count. In the end, there were only 50 survivors. Well... They say only because almost all of those survivors were young men who were sent to fight in the war, a hundred strong with only a small contingent returning. And then eight of those survivors were part of the same family, and they'd been traveling out of town the night Hyde burned. One of those survivors was a night watchman who was guarding the nearby request stop. He was known to be a bit of a drunk, no family to speak of, and it was him who reported the fire as it began to spread. He wondered why the local small fire department hadn't tried to put it out and sent for help from the next town over. He was also the one who found the town's last survivor. Elaine O'Donnell was 14 years old at the time. They found her half-dead from inhaling the smoke and ash, and they were able to revive her en route to the nearest hospital out of town. When she was finally cognizant enough to tell people what happened, it was said she was raving mad, telling tales of the dead disguised as the living, puppets made of human flesh. The newspapers at the time caught wind of her words and sensationalized her ravings, given that she was the only one with first-hand accounts of the fire the only one who could have known what happened to the rest of Hyde. Because, even after putting out the fire, there was nothing left of Hyde's townsfolk. Nearly 400 people vanished, without a trace. The papers called her raving, but when you actually read through accounts of those who met with Elaine, she was apparently of dead-eyed demeanor. The picture of calm, even as she told tall tales of the fates of her fellow townsfolk. She was young, 
she was a girl. And she had gone through something terribly traumatic. So, they wrote her stories off as nothing but the manner in which a fractured mind interpreted such a terrible experience, akin to the shell shock of soldiers who came home from the horrors of war, not quite the same as they had been. Even the papers that called her crazy felt sympathy for the young girl who'd lost her home and her entire family to the fire. But most people still wondered how it was that nobody could find the remains of those lost to the fire. Some even wondered, was it even a fire that had taken the people of Hyde? In the end, the loss of Hyde was overshadowed by the end of the war. It was forgotten, abandoned as a ghost town. People moved on. Many had lost loved ones in the war. The pain of those lost to the family. The pain of those who lost family in Hyde was no greater than that, at least in their eyes. Then, there is Elaine. Please repeat your name for the recording. Elaine O'Donnell. And where are you from, Miss O'Donnell? Ha! <laughs> you know where I'm from. For the record, please. I've been living in this Toronto madhouse for a long time, but... I grew up in Hyde. The burn town. The husk. The famous ghost town, as some what you types call it. Yes. You were a survivor of the fire. That's right. The fire. Would you mind recounting the night of the fire? And your experiences during and after the event? <laughs> You've heard it all before. I've said it about a hundred times over. What's the point of all this? It's for our records, Miss O'Donnell. Screw your bloody records. You're going to make this poor, fragile-minded woman live her trauma store again? Listen to her fantasies or delusions? I don't think it was a fantasy, Miss O'Donnell. And neither do you. Oh, so you're one of those. Gonna help me meet my mum in the afterlife? Do a seance, talk to my dear old dad? No, ma'am. I'm just a journalist. <laughs> then you're wasting time. I've told my story. You're years too late for a scoop. I never said I was here for a scoop, miss. Then what are you here for? The truth. About that night. Not the spin, not the mockery, not the theories. I want to hear it from the one person who saw it happen. And I want her to know that I will believe everything she says. Even if everything I say is the reason I've been living in a loony hospital my entire adult life? Where do you want me to begin? Wherever you think it began. The events that led to the entirety of Hyde being wiped off the map in a single night. <laughs> oh, it didn't just take one night, Gumshoe. It took years to get to that point. It's just that nobody would listen. Neither did we, until it was too late. Oh, it was a beautiful town. Even the ruins look beautiful now when I can bring myself to look at the pictures people have taken. You know how many detectives come to me asking for help locating the bodies? Because the town had none of the corpses you'd expect from such a massive fire. 
I knew they wouldn't find anything. But... <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. It started all the way back when I was... 10. Just about 11. I was a little monster and my mother, bless her, was too tolerant of my behaviour. Said it was because I looked like my nan when she was young. With my red hair and gap tooth smile. I always hated my smile, if only because it looked nothing like the straight, perfect teeth of my best friend Laurie, who I always thought was prettier than me, with her black hair and eyes and straight white teeth. But I can admit, it got me out of a heap of trouble whenever I stumbled into it. Especially around the crossroads. The crossroads was the nickname locals gave the town centre, since it was right off the local church and where the four main roads in town met down the middle. Officially, it was called Hyde Square. The crossroads were bustling then. An open-air market most mornings and all of Sunday. And sometimes you got these quaint little shows where the barons would gather while their parents did the shopping and chatting. I don't remember the first time the puppet show was put on, but I remember that it was a big hit whenever the puppet master was around. They were from Toronto, you see. Had a summer cottage up in Hyde. Went up there for weeks at a time when they were on holiday from whatever their work was in the big city. I'd have said the puppet shows where they're living. That and the craftsmanship they did with all those dancing little dolls, but I heard from the gossiping adults that they were well-to-do. Lived large in the city and came up to the town for some peace and quiet pursuing their craft. I say they, because I actually don't know if they were a man or a woman. Nobody knew. They had that look, what's the word? Androgynous. Face like they were dull themselves. And a small, thin lipped smile that was genuine but crooked. Like they knew some kind of secret. When we asked, they'd give us this little shrug. And when we asked what to call them, they gave it some thought before saying they were a doll doctor. And just to call them doctor if we had to call them anything at all. The doll doctor was perhaps everyone's favourite adult in town whenever they came up from the city. They'd set up their little stand and children would line up and ask for their broken toys to be repaired, which a doctor would do with their crooked little smile. But as with any adults who'd captured the hearts and minds of children, the doctor wasn't much loved by everyone. The local priest, Father Mallory, he wasn't well pleased with the doctor's visits. Claimed their quaint shows would turn the children to the devil. <laughs> I wonder if he's vindicated up in heaven for seeing the doctor for what they were, but... Then again, Father Mallory wasn't exactly above board himself, so... Maybe he's crying judgement from the fires of hell. Maybe the doctor's down there with him. <laughs> or maybe they're still around. I don't know. I hope not, but... But who's to say fire kills him dead the same? Father Mallory, you see. He was ruining the doctor's little shows with his proselytizing. Shouted louder than the doctor's little songs. The children were upset by this, so one day... The doctor came right up to Father Mallory. Looked him straight in the eye. And invited him to tea. I'd like to show you my workshop said the doctor, where I make these puppets, lovingly, by hand. There is not to fear from me. This is simply how I find my peace with the many troubles that follow me from the city. The first time, Father Mallory scoffed and refused to come to the doctor's beautiful little summer house. The second time, one of the adults encouraged him to welcome a new believer. The third time, Mallory finally agreed, and off they went. Not a day later, Father Mallory was singing a different tune, if he spoke at all. He came to the crossroads with holy book in hand, but greeted the doctor more cordially than anyone expected, and remained quiet as a prayer when the doctor's show commenced. And the two of them went on to the doctor's house right after, for another afternoon of tea.
For the parents who are uncomfortable seeing their faith leaders' beliefs clashing with one who brought their children joy and they themselves peace, it was a remarkable development. After the doctor departed for his year of work, there was an odd serenity to Mallory that nobody had ever seen outside of his meditations. He was slower to anger, if he ever angered at all, and he seemed to find more comfort in the drone and repetitions of his prayers than anything. He had no family in the town to speak of. The flock was his family, after all. I wonder sometimes if he had a wife to go home to, a child to care for, or someone who took care of him the way he, he took care of the community. If someone would have seen the signs early. <laughs> Laurie and I were just happy Mallory no longer leered and judged as he did in Sunday Mass. We didn't care for much beyond that. It was Laurie who cooked up the idea to sneak into the doctor's house while they were away. She claimed there must have been magic in that house, explaining how her beautiful porcelain Annie had been shattered beyond repair by a neighborhood boy. How she'd brought the pieces to the doctor in tears. And the doctor looked pensively at the piece before proclaiming they'd need to take the doll home for proper repairs at their workshop. How the doctor had returned little Annie to Laurie perfect, as if new, without even seams to mark the cracks where Annie had broken. It got into Laurie's head, then. The idea that the doctor was magic. Consumed her every time she looked at her Annie, smiling her perfect doll smile. We were twelve when we made to sneak around the back of the doctor's summer home. We'd known they were rich, but... If we had any doubt, this house would have dispelled it. A beautiful brick affair, both old yet pristine, small but clearly well managed, with a garden of fresh flower and bushes that were kept by a local through the seasons. It was fall when we snuck around the back of the house, and the leaves were starting to color on the trees, with the hardier flowers still blooming till the first hint of winter. We squeezed round the bent gate, and I remember lifting Laurie on my shoulders to get her through the back window that she shimmied open. Took a bit of doing to get me over that ledge. Laurie was a slender girl, not much for lifting, but eventually we were able to both stumble into what looked like a sitting room. The chairs were covered up with sheets, and the fireplace was all shut up. But there was nothing to hide. The dozens of eyes staring down at us from the mantel. The tops of shelves, and even along the round center table. The puppets and dolls of all shapes surrounded us, their glass eyes seeming to follow us wherever you moved. I was unsettled, but Laurie was absolutely delighted. It was grand, she said, to have so much money that the doctor could have such a beautiful, and certainly expensive, look and collection. Each and every one of those dolls and stringed-up marionettes were delicately detailed, down to the embroidery on their clothing. Even their eyes seemed real, though up close you could tell they were glass the way they shone in the dim light. She wanted to steal a doll. I talked her out of it, out of character for me, but something about all the eyes made me antsy, even if they weren't real. We crept through the house's carpeted halls with our shoes in hand, careful with our movements in case we attracted any unwanted attention. We found what looked to be a second bedroom, if the first was up the stairs, and... Sheets cleanly folded and a Bible resting on the bedside table. There were dolls even here, though not quite as many. Just two little rag dolls rested on the pillow. Hair made from red yarn and black, and entirely unlike the wooden porcelain affairs in the sitting room. Look, Laurie had said, they're just like us. I talked her out of stealing those too. They must have been special, made for play rather than to be displayed. For a child, maybe. We found the kitchen and stole sweets from a bowl resting on the countertop. Brightly wrapped cream eggs that we reasoned nobody would miss. It was under the scrutiny of puppets behind high glass shelves and above pantries of food. But they smiled pleasantly as if in welcome. Some of their hands raised in greeting. We felt no shame. With sticky fingers, we found a study. The door handle made of glass. It was the strangest room of them all, even with the sitting room lined with people on every shelf. 
There were dolls here too, but half finished. Unclothed or lacking limbs. Missing eyes or painted faces. It wasn't that odd. It was a workshop. Their study for the meticulous craft they underwent whenever they stayed here. What was odd was a table. The tools we expected were held upright in a little cup. But there were drawings. Sketches of, well, anatomy. Flesh bodies. Guides of dissection. Elaborate pictures of muscle and sinew that move joints in the arm. One that stood out was a detailed diagram of the brain. Marked points for an operation. Just like a real doctor. What we thought were wood carving tools were accompanied by scalpels and tongs and all sorts of equipment we'd often seen at a clinic. It was disturbing to see, but even then, we were filled with so much trust for our doctor that we were excited to find this piece of the puzzle. We realized then, the doll doctor was a real doctor all along. A surgeon, even. Must have had a practice down in Toronto, and took the rest up in Hyde, doing meticulous work with steady hands. The last room we made to explore at the end of the carpeted hallway was a basement. We opened the door and found a narrow stairway with a single light fixture at the mouth, not shining far enough to see the button. I went first, with Laurie trailing carefully behind me, and I was surprised to find that at the end of the stairway... It was a heavy old wooden door, entirely out of place. The polished wood had been carved to look like a face asleep, and I remember this clearly because I'd stared at the closed eyes for so long before Laurie startled me out of it, trying to get the door open. It was locked up tight, wouldn't budge a bit, and eventually Laurie and I gave up, though she gave the carved face the same look of wonder she'd given all the other dolls and puppets in the sitting room. It was years ago now, but... I still remember what Laurie said to me when we were making our way up the hollow wooden stairs. She wondered how it was that the door had such beautiful eyes. I forgot about it for a long time. I think I wanted to ask what she meant in that moment, but, but we were both caught off guard when we heard the distinct sound of a door closing on the first floor landing. An old lock being turned right at the end of the hall, where the front door was. We stopped in our tracks, held their breaths as we heard quiet but weighty footsteps along the carpet, the opening and closing of doors. We panicked as we heard the door to the study open and shut, right before the basement stairs. I acted first, grabbing the handle and keeping it steady. Laurie caught on and grabbed it with me, and we put our meager weight into pulling the door back, just as a muffled footstep stopped in front of a basement. We felt the handle begin to struggle against our grip. We held fast, hoping that whoever it was assumed the door was locked and would ask no more questions. I was just about convinced that they'd realize it hadn't been locked before, that someone had broken into the house, that they'd find some keys to check the basement, but... But after two or three tries to jiggle the handle, the person behind the door simply gave up and walked away. When all was silent for a time, Laurie and I carefully opened the door to the light of the afternoon, and we crept our way across the hall, peeking around corners to make sure we weren't spotted. It was in the front den, window open to a clear view of the garden and the street beyond, that I saw the man who had scared us so. Father Mallory, sitting in the den, reading the Bible I recognized from the other bedroom with the little girl ragdolls. He was unmoving, though every so often he'd turn a page, his eyes fixed on the words of God. I hadn't realized he and the doctor had grown so close, though. Well, we didn't have much time to ponder this development right then. And Laurie and I hurried to the silent sitting room, slipping out the back of the house through the window. It was, in our eyes, an unquestionable success. I know this isn't a story you're asked for, but I think it's important for later. After that, when we were both thirteen, blossoming into young women according to our mothers, the doctor returned to Hyde for Christmas. 
Last season was a bit of a somber affair. The war had taken so many of our young men in the very same year, and the doctor returned to a hide that was less bustling and less colourful than years past. Still, they sang and played for the children, and though we were getting too old to be part of the intended audience, Laurie and I were still enamoured enough by our mysterious doctor that we spoke to them afterwards, with Laurie begging to know about their work in the city. The doctor seemed pleased by her interest, asked if she wanted to learn their craft, said it'd be happy to have extra hands around assisting their work. We couldn't let it be known we learned of the profession through their study, but Laurie coaxed them into telling her about their practice. The doctor admitted that they had done studies in anatomy, though their true passion was for creation. If I cannot create the way God intended his children, said the doctor, shrugging as though it was an old hurt, but a hurt nonetheless, then I shall create with my hands in all the ways I am able. It was Christmas Day when Hyde's many families, in need of comfort in time of scarcity, were given a feast by the well-to-do doctor. They put on a variation of the ballet, the Nutcracker, with beautiful child-sized dancing puppets on delicate near-invisible strings, as both children and adults sat along long tables and were served rich foods not seen since the start of the war. The alcohol flowed like Jesus with the wine, never ending in warming cheeks and bellies. The doctor called himself Herr Drosselmeyer, parading a series of dancing Russians, Chinamen, fairies and rat kings and sword-wielding soldiers. And just for one day, and well into the night, allowed the people to feel safe, happy and warm. Ever since then, you were hard-pressed to find a resident of Hyde who didn't love the doctor, including myself. I love them so much for bidding smiles to the hearts and faces of my parents after my elder brother had gone away. It never made sense that they would do so much for people who weren't even their family, that they only ever saw a few times a year. But in our minds, we simply thought they were one of the few good people in the world, who gave without take and who had love in their heart for all. You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapul. Hey everyone, this is Reg Helly, co-creator and co-producer of Hainai. Hainai is a podcast produced by Motsi Dapol, Yoi Halago, and me, and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial share-alike 4.0 international license. Today's episode was written and directed by Motsi Dapol, who also plays the role of Elaine and the journalist. The role of Evelyn was played by Natalie. To help support the production of Hainai, you can buy us a milk tea, a coffee, or subscribe to our Coffee Gold at coffee.com slash hainaipod. That's ko-fi.com slash hainaipod. Or you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash hainaipod. 
Our next Patreon exclusive Remind Me to Tell You Later episode, But E But, will be airing in April. Speaking of Patreon, shout out to all our Patreons Billy Atienza, Victoria Goodwin, Nicole, Burley Forty, David Gordon, Sinadone, Cecil, Rhea Campbell, Malaya Light, Robbie, Rebecca Mad Gastronomer, Disc Monde, and our latest Patreon, Jordanos Belete. Your support has done so much for our podcast and means the world to us. Also, don't forget to check out official Hainai merchandise on our Redbubble store at redbubble.com slash people slash Hainai pod. Hainai is available on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We're aiming to reach 1,000 YouTube subscribers by the end of the year, so it would really mean a lot if you hit that subscribe button on youtube.com slash Hainai pod. We'll be premiering new episodes as YouTube live streams before posting on the usual podcast listening apps. That way, listeners get to chime in on the chat while the episode plays. We'd love to hear your reactions in real time. Speaking of live streams, we have a special birthday live stream coming up in April. Watch out for some announcements we have regarding that. For more news and updates, don't forget to follow us on our official blog, highnipod.tumblr.com, and also on our socials Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at highnipod. Leave a rating and review when you check us out. And with that, thank you, we love you, and hanggang sa muli.